want to make connections, you know, amongst the films. But for me, creatively, that isn't an issue. You know, it's not, it doesn't help me make the movie to think about those things. I'm not trying to be evasive because, you know, we, I could I could say things that would connect this movie with those other movies. Um, uh, I could say, for example, that Freud, his revolution was to insist on the reality of the human body. You know, at a time when when nobody spoke about the human body, uh, 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 everything was repressed. It was a very repressive era, very taboo to talk about sex, to talk about. Um, strange things like sadomasochism and so on, and child abuse and incest. Freud talked about those things, and he insisted that the body, the human body, is the first fact of human existence. And so, once you think of that, you can start to connect this movie with your drama or the rule of arts, something with the human body. Yeah, you can connect it with all the other movies. So, but as I say, I, I'm, I'm only thinking of that now that you ask me. It's not something that I thought of before I made the movie because it's not part of the creative process that I go through. It's, a, it's an independent choice, right? It's an independent way you develop the, the movie. The movie is independent from the others. You've done it, 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 it exists alone, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, hello. I would like to ask a question to Paul. I'm right here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hello. <laughs> Hi, um, good evening to all of you. I have to congratulate David for his spectacular career. I'm a huge fan. But I would like to ask to Paul Giamatti, why just now to work with David Cronenberg? Has he forgotten you, your number? Or... <laughs> oh, maybe the question is going to be both of you. Why just now? Because he was broke and I offered him a fortune. <laughs> I was, I was unemployed at the time on the phone. <laughs> he said, it's David Cronenberg. I said, yeah, fine. You got a job for me then? What do you got for me? Um, I don't know. Now, I, I don't know. I don't know if we were ever going to do something else. I don't remember. No. So now he needed somebody to play a psychopath who was in love with Robert Pattinson. <laughs> That's me, man. <laughs> <laughs> so you needed somebody to do that. Uh, that was available. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, how is it working in Michael and Vigo? So they can't really answer that. But, oh well, um, wonderful. I mean, uh, first of all, Vigo and, and uh, Michael Fassbender are—they have a great sense of humor, and they—they they love to play, and uh, they love to sing rock and roll songs together uh, when we're not shooting, even though they're wearing their period clothes. <laughs> they are in the Belvedere Gardens in Vienna. And the uh, footage of them singing old rock and roll songs is on the net. You can see it somewhere on YouTube, I think. So you can see that they, they really got along probably better than Freud and Jung did. Um, and they both, they, they work in similar ways. I mean, they, they're both also very prepared. Uh, Vigo is notorious for the depth of his preparation and travel around the world, looking for I think, old books that Freud might have had in his office and, and so on. And Michael, he, Michael said that all he needed to do was to read The Idiot's Guide to Jung. Um, and that was enough for him. Whereas Vigo read everything that Freud ever wrote. <laughs> So they do, they do have a slightly different approach, uh, but uh, ultimately that um, what, what's great is that they, they can let go of their, their, their egos completely and sub submerge themselves into the characters and, and that was, you know, it, we had, a, once again, we had a lot of fun on the set. I mean, it was very, uh, uh, very light and, and, uh, and uh, what can I say, you know, like that.
Plus they're very cute. Yeah. They're very cute and handsome, so I like it. that's good. Hi, David. Here. I just want to ask you uh, why Robert Pattinson, and were you surprised that he's talented? <laughs> Surprised by what? By his talents. He said he's superb. We, oh, we know him oh no, no, I wasn't, I wasn't surprised at all. I would be, it, it's like Kira in this movie, A Dangerous Method. Uh, I think that she is a very underrated actress. And I've worked with some of the best actresses in the world. I mean, Miranda Richardson and Naomi Watts and Lynn Redgrave. And, um, and Kira is as good as they are. And I wasn't surprised, you know. Uh, what, what did surprise me, well, that you never know, is how also well prepared she was and how, uh, I mean, one or two takes for those very different, diff difficult scenes and, and, uh, and we were all really in awe of that, you know, but I, I knew she was very talented. You know, as a director you are a fool if you cast someone who has no talent <laughs> because you cannot hypnotize an actor into being great or even good uh, if he's no good there's nothing you could do about it, you know, it's really not good. So, um, I looked at a lot of movies and, and things that uh, Rob Pattinson had done, and then I spoke to him, we talked, and I was completely convinced that he would be great in the movie, and he was. Um, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's strange how you judge an actor, especially, you know, when, when, if you're working with someone like Paul, who has a huge body of work, and you can see the range that he has, uh, that makes it easy to know how, that he's really good. But uh, with someone Rob, like Rob, who's, who's very young, and he hasn't, hasn't done all that much, and, and three of his movies are Twilight movies, and so it's sort of the same thing. Uh, and, so, and so I looked at uh, a movie called Little Ashes, uh, which in fact was shot by Peter's son, Adam, um, in which he played Salvador Dali uh, with a Spanish accent. That was really interesting. Interesting that he would do that because it's a strange role to play and it's not the kind of role that somebody who wants to be a big movie star would play. And in fact, Rob is hes very surprised that he's a, a movie star. He really is an actor. And I, it was very apparent you know, to me that that was the case. So I was not at all surprised. Um, I could see the talent and uh, but that's something you have to do as a director. It's one of the most important things uh, that you can do as a director is be good at casting, but it's, people don't notice it. It's, it's invisible, you know, because it's before you say action or cut, you can kill your movie by casting the wrong people. So you have to really be good at it. And, uh, and, uh, and yet there's no rules, you know, there's no guidebook that tells you how to do this. Okay. I think one of the things about Rob, too, working with him, is that he plays such a strong character and he looks so good in the, you know, Armani suits. He's got this great American accent and he's so sure of himself and he's so strong. And then as soon as you call cut, he kind of turns back into this self deprecating British guy. And he'd literally be at the end of the take and, I'd, and then he'd start talking to me and I'd, and I'd look at him and I'd just think, where did that other guy go? Where did that American guy go? And, and so it was so kind of transformative in a way that um, is, it would be really exciting, I think, for a lot of people to see. Yeah, Kira was the same, actually. You know, she was playing Russian Jewish insane, and then suddenly she was <laughs> English, not Jewish insane. <laughs> Um, Paul, you know, was always a blithering guy who was in love with Rob Pattinson, so that was, <laughs> he didn't change. Um, treatment of psychoanalytic theory in the movie. Yeah. 
Um, well, I have never uh, undergone psychoanalysis, and that is because I am so completely normal. <laughs> I have no problems. <laughs> so that's why. Um, but but um, uh, what's interesting is, of course, the movie is is showing us the beginning of psychoanalysis, and of course, in in, in, in years later, it, it's split into many different fragments. There's Adlerian. Uh, analysis, there's Jungian, there's, uh, now there's cognitive behavioral therapy and so on. But what was interesting for me to see was sort of the, the, the invention of that psychoanalytic relationship, which was a brand new relationship that never existed before Freud, the relationship between an analyst and his patient, you know, the idea that you come to a stranger, you don't know this person, and he asks you to tell him everything about yourself, the most intimate secrets, uh, erotic, sexual, neurotic, family, whatever. Um, a, a, a very strange and interesting new relationship. So um, we, we knew a lot about it because it's in the nature of psychoanalysis that you record everything. If you're talking about dreams, you record all your dreams, you write them down. And, uh, and these people in the film were very obsessive about everything. They would record everything. They, would, they wrote letters constantly to each other, and they wrote diaries. And uh, for example, uh, we have the admission uh, papers of Jung for Sabina. In other words, we have 50, 50 pages of description of Sabina's symptoms and her illness and how she, what she said when she came to the Berkholz and so on. So we, it's really a lot of the dialogue in the movie. Comes